Welcome to the Mondo Wise Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Reed. At Mondo Wise, we cover the movements, activists, and policymakers who affect the struggle for freedom in Palestine. In this episode, we have a conversation with Wassam Sharaf, an advocate with the Civil and Political Rights Unit at Adela, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel. Mondo Weiss Palestine correspondent Yumna Patel sat down with Wassam to discuss what life has been like for Palestinian citizens of Israel over the past two months. In May, Palestinian citizens of Israel participated in massive protests and boycotts as part of the Unity Uprisings, in what many Palestinians have described as the largest display of unity in years. In the wake of the protests, Palestinian citizens of Israel have continued to be arrested en masse and jailed. Despite this, Wassam and other advocates say that air of resistance in Palestinian communities in Israel remains strong. So joining us today is Wissam Sharaf, a human rights advocate and full-time attorney with Adela, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel. In addition to his work as a teaching and research assistant in international law at Haifa University, Wissam is also an activist in his hometown in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights. Wissam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Yumna. So, you know, today we're going to be discussing um, sort of the events of last month that we saw and what many people deemed as the the unity uprisings. Um, Particularly, we'd like to speak to you about the participation of Palestinians living, of Palestinian citizens in Israel, who for the purpose of this conversation, um, we're going to be referring to a lot as 48 Palestinians, um, just so for our audience who maybe aren't familiar with that terminology, 48 Palestinians or Palestinians living in 48 are those, you know, almost 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel, you know, those who are living within the borders of the state that was founded in 1948. So that's just a little clarification for our audience who, who might not be familiar with the terminology. So, Wissam, I'd like to start off sort of going over the, the accounts of, of what happened last month. You know, we saw countless videos of Palestinians in places like Yaffa, Haifa, and Akka coming under attack from, from right-wing Israeli Jewish mobs. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like um, for Palestinians in 48 during those very, you know, tumultuous few weeks that we saw last month? And what was the atmosphere like? Could you just describe it for us? The events of last month, it's, uh, first of all, there is a need to remind everyone that it was the last days of Ramadan. Uh, Just before uh, Eid al-Fitr, everybody was preparing for uh, celebratory uh, evenings for uh, uh, to celebrate the, the Eid and uh, also uh, to celebrate the end of uh, the uh, Ramadan month. We, I have witnessed, yani, in, in all these uh, days that have that have been, yani, very, uh, very hard for a lot of uh, Palestinians and Arabs living in uh, cities. Uh, like Yaffa, Haifa, and Akka, and also Lid and Ramli, uh, the cities that contain uh, also Jewish uh, citizens and also Arab citizens. The events are unprecedented. This clashes, these uh, uh, يعني, uh, breaches, uh, these uh, uh, attacks haven't been president uh, in, uh, in in Palestine since 1929. During these evenings, uh, when the uh, right-wing mobs walked over uh, in the streets searching for Arabs to, uh, to lynch, it was a very uh, scary moment for a lot of us. Uh, living in a, a city that is uh, that also contains uh, Jewish and uh, Arab citizens uh, have always been challenging. You don't uh, live the uh, the atmosphere of uh, uh, of being Ghani. To have uh, your uh, living in uh, cities uh, that contain also Jewish and also Arab citizens mm-hmm. don't allow you to live your culture on a daily basis. So it's already challenging. And mm-hmm. to add to that, the feeling of not being uh, secure uh, the fear for your life and the fear for your property uh, have been uh, 
uh, scary uh, feelings. Uh, these uh, days uh, have left their marks in all of us, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. uh, searching for uh, uh, answers from the uh, uh, the uh, yani international community as well as uh, the Israeli community uh, uh, about the myth of coexistence mm-hmm. in these cities. We have witnessed the police, uh, the Israeli police, protecting and uh, participating with uh, the right-wing uh, mobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, in some cases uh, uh, that I have uh, uh, witnessed in my work as an attorney, uh, s- people have been attacked uh, and police were there. Yani police uh, were in the scene and they asked, the police's help, but they didn't provide that help, and they just let them for their fate. These uh, events, yeah, these were what what happened in the last days of of Ramadan and uh, Eid al-Fitr, uh, have left their marks uh, on everyone living in uh, in these cities. You know, there's something that you mentioned as well. You know that this was the sort of um, actions and things that we were seeing. Um, in those last days of of Ramadan and in those few weeks last month was sort of unprecedented. The last time that was sort of witnessed was in the late 1920s. And that was something that was being talked about a lot by by Palestinians across the board, not just in in 48, but um, in other parts of Palestine and the diaspora as well, was people were really paying attention to the levels of participation. You know, we saw widespread participation in protests across Palestinian cities and communities in 48. And these protests that we saw in Lidda, Ramla, and Haifa, and, and um, Yaffa, and Akka, these, these seem to spark a huge sense of, of unity between Palestinians across all of Palestine and the diaspora. Could you just give us a little more insight into what were the protests like in 48? Um, around that time, you know, who were the leaders of the protests? We heard a lot of talk that, you know, these protests were being led by youth and grassroots movements, etc. Do you feel like there was, you know, in addition to the the very violent attacks that, that Palestinians in 48 were facing on themselves and on their property, do you feel like there was also something different about the protests that we saw this time than maybe we've witnessed in, in, in recent history in 48? Protests uh, of, of last uh, of, of May, uh, I I have witnessed that. Yeah, and these protests have been mainly led by uh, uh, young people, uh, the youth students of universities, uh, schools, uh, who have been subject to uh, a lot of discriminatory. Uh, policies by the Israeli state, and uh, the the spark that uh, led to that was uh, the uh, attack on Al Aqsa uh, during the uh, Laylat Al Qadr. This, uh, yani, I have seen that the grassroots and also yani, young people taking uh, in their initiatives and going out to, to the streets to protest. Yeah, all the discriminatory policies in Jerusalem against Sheikh Jarrah and also the attacks on Al-Aqsa uh, as an extraordinary event. We are not familiar with uh, with this kind of uh, protests, uh, at least in the recent years. Uh, most of the protests have been led by uh, the uh, the political leadership of uh, Palestinians in 48, uh, the high follow-up committee for uh, uh, for Arabs uh, in uh, in Israel that also joined, yani, the political leadership also joined these uh, protests, but they, they, they brought, the spark for these protests came from the youth. Mm-hmm. Uh, this uh, actually uh, gives a feeling of hope that with all the discriminatory policies that a Palestinian in 48 is subject to since birth, uh, all the... Uh, um, I would call it mind washing that uh, uh, the uh, school students are subject to in schools didn't lead to uh, a disconnect 
between the uh, Palestinians in 48 and uh, events that happened in Jerusalem or the West Bank or, or Gaza. On the contrary, it led to, uh, as you described, a feeling of unity. And this also was well, was felt in the streets. Uh, so the protests that were led by the youth uh, mainly actually yani, uh, gave the feeling that there is no disconnect between 48 uh, and uh, other parts of Palestine, although they have been subject to a lot of uh, mind-washing policies, discriminatory policies uh, from the uh, uh, Israeli state to just to to establish such a disconnection. This was also felt in the streets, in the protests themselves, uh, with the, all the chants that the youth have been using mm-hmm. uh, in support of Gaza, in support of uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, in support of Sheikh Jarrah uh, that uh, led to uh, such a huge feeling of unity, of being a part of people. This haven't been uh, the case in recent years. Uh, the protests have been uh, scattered uh, with, uh, when, when something happened, when, when there is events, yani, uh, the protests have been scattered, uh, sometimes led by the political uh, leadership that in 48. This time it it, it was more uh, comprehensive, I would say, for all uh, of Palestinians in 48. You know, you mentioned these these protests sort of giving people a sense of hope, and I know from being in Palestine that something that did give people a lot of hope also was the massive levels of participation that we saw in 48 during the general strike that people called for on, on May 18. From your perspective and from what you witnessed, what were the levels of participation that you saw, you know, amongst Palestinians in 48? Was it as widespread as, you know, people understood it to be? Could you just sort of paint us a picture of how the general strike on May 18th may have affected, you know, Israeli society or the Israeli economy. You know, before I'll just give an example, maybe for those who are listening, there were reports that came out after the after the general strike on May 18th that um, because of the levels of participation that were witnessed, for example, amongst Palestinian laborers from the West Bank who work in construction inside Israel, many sector, many parts of, you know, um, the Israeli, the Israeli economy centered around construction were were totally shut down. So I'm interested in in hearing your your point of view of of how participation was amongst 48 Palestinians on um, on May 18th with the general strike. First, first of all, I would like to mention that the strike as a means of protest is one of the uh, most peaceful uh, ways of demonstration that uh, any person could imagine. It's just uh, saying that I am not doing anything in protest of uh, some uh, policies. Uh, so, uh, and also the it gives a huge feeling of unity between uh, between uh, the community itself because uh, being on strike doesn't only mean uh, to affect the economy uh, of the other side or also to. Uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, my uh, my views or to demonstrate my voice, but also means to strengthen my, the community. Uh, the wide I uh, witnessed uh, a huge uh, compelling with the with the call for the strike. There was a lot of people who uh, actually uh, didn't go to work. Uh, stores that closed their doors uh, and. Uh, I have witnessed a huge uh, portion of participation in the in the uh, in the strike. But what was unique about uh, the strike of uh, May 18th uh, was the activities, also led by the youth and uh, grassroots uh, organizations, being done in the streets of our villages and towns mm-hmm. to uh, to. Uh, to also strengthen this feeling of a community and to uh, uh, educate and spread uh, information uh, to the younger generations about from the experience of the elders. Uh, this by itself was heartwarming and gave a huge feeling of uh, 
uh, unity and uh, hope, as I mentioned before. Uh, I am pretty sure that all this have uh, affected the uh, economy, uh, the Israeli economy, in a huge way. Uh, I we have uh, witnessed. Uh, I don't uh, have exact numbers, but. Uh, some press releases talked about millions of losses to the Israeli economy uh, during only one day of uh, of strike. Mm-hmm. Uh, this also left a uh, huge mark on the employers uh, themselves who tried to pressure the uh, employees, the Arab employees, to come to work. But uh, the sense of unity with when everybody stood and said no, uh, it also strengthened uh, the employees' positions in front of the employers. I would like also to add that the strike of May 18th was a war- warning sign for uh, for the Israeli public. You, yani, the people, the Palestinians of 48, are also by the part of all of Palestine, mm-hmm. and their strike is such an effective way on your economy that you need to double check. Uh, before proceeding uh, forward with discriminatory policies and uh, with the m- mass evacuations, with the attacking uh, uh, protesters, attacking uh, Gaza, from the fear that it will, it, it, it will, yeah, it may come back again, a strike for weeks or months. Uh, may lead to yeah, a financial crisis. This uh, message was felt very strong, also in the Israeli media, also in the streets. You know, from your activities and your work on the ground, do you think that we might be seeing more actions like that and and more more efforts by organizers to 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 call for for more strikes in the future? For the uh, for the uh, right reasons. Uh, I would see that as, as I mentioned before, the uh, one of the most effective ways uh, to protest, one of the most peaceful ways to protest, and one of the uh, most useful for the community itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so I would uh, hope that uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, of free speech would would come again. Uh, in the future, if uh, the Israeli state would continue uh, with its uh, discriminatory policies against Palestinians, a lot of the the moments that we saw the during the movement, you know, as people were characterizing it, right, as the unity uprisings and the massive levels of of participation that we were seeing in in forty eight, really did inspire, I think, a lot of hope amongst. Palestinians, not just in Palestine, but, you know, in the diaspora and across the world as well. But, you know, since those uprisings that we sort of saw in May and after the the ceasefire that was called in in Gaza, um, we've seen that a lot of protests, you know, have since, quote unquote, quieted down. Obviously, things are by no means normal for Palestinians living under occupation or, you know, living under Israel's apartheid regime. But, now, specifically in, in the immediate aftermath of, of these sort of protests, Palestinians, um, especially 48 Palestinians, are facing another threat, which is Israel's sort of massive arrest campaign of, of Palestinian protesters to, um, as Israeli police have put it, quote, settle the score. Can you tell us more about what the climate's been like um, amongst, you know, Palestinian communities inside Israel as they sort of face this this massive crackdown? What what do they see as the goal of this this arrest campaign? Who are Israeli forces, you know, particularly targeting? And if you could give us an idea of of perhaps how many people um, have been arrested um, how many Palestinian citizens of Israel have been arrested so far, if you have an idea on that? Since uh, the uh, the beginning of the assault on, on Gaza, uh, since the 9th of May, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we have witnessed a huge number of people being detained and arrested by the Israeli police during uh, protests. During the protests that were held down in 
uh, almost every Palestinian uh, uh, village, town, or city. Uh, these uh, arrests uh, that came yani, from peaceful protests uh, continued even after uh, the ceasefire and even after the uh, the protests were uh, stopped. The Israeli police uh, declared after the uh, the ceasefire in Gaza that it would launch a, a campaign that it uh, the, that the the Israeli police called law and order declared that one of the purposes of uh, this arrest campaign uh, is to settle the score with uh, with the Arab community. Uh, is uh, to deter uh, the Arab community to to and uh, to apply the law. First of all, all these uh, goals of of such uh, an arrest campaign are illegal, even according to the Israeli law itself. Uh, the Supreme, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court, have decided in the past that using uh, the arrest itself as means for deterrence. Uh, is illegal. Uh, the uh, the goal of uh, of deterring people, uh, yani, uh, using the criminal law, uh, is being. Uh, it should be done only after proving the accusations being brought against the detainee, uh, not using his arrest uh, as means to deter a whole society. This is cut clear. Uh, a collective punishment by the Israeli police for the uh, Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. Uh, during these two weeks of uh, the arrest campaign, more than uh, 2,400 people have been arrested according to the official numbers of the police. Uh, 91% of the people arrested are uh, Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. Uh, this, uh, by these numbers, these percentage, يعني, only nine percent of of the arrests uh, are among uh, uh, Jewish uh, people. So it tells the whole story that uh, that I was just telling. Uh, such an arrest campaign is by no uh, means is. Uh, um, is made to apply the law. Uh, it's only uh, uh, another, yani, the goals of uh, such a campaign is uh, cut clear, just to take revenge. The Israeli police uh, have been subject to a lot of critiques recently, and they want to take revenge from the Arab society uh, to maintain uh, the Jewish supremacy in, uh, in the state. We have witnessed arrests of uh, minors from their homes, the way of the arrests also, the police breaking with huge forces to arrest a minor who's 14 years old, for example. They would come with uh, four or five uh, police cars, uh, a force of 15 people, and uh, take the uh, minor from his home, from his family, uh, after searching the whole house and breaking the the properties, attacking the people uh, inside the house, his parents, his families, for example. Uh, so also, yani, the way that the Israeli police uh, uh, did these arrests is uh, just to show, uh, is, is, is a show, actually. is a show to show its power. Uh, this uh, is being understood by uh, the Israeli, the Palestinians in forty eight. Although it led to uh, indictment lists against more than 200 people, uh, but still we, the vast majority of people have been released after, the, the, uh, after their arrest, uh, which also t- uh, tells the story about uh, how random uh, these arrests are, that they have no legal basis or any basis at all. It's also uh, the time to mention that the arrested people, the detainees, have wit- have been subject to uh, uh, ill treatment inside of the uh, police stations that also could amount to torture. We have uh, witnessed, yani we have uh, witnessed in Adala, 
We have also gather, gathered affidavits and testimonies uh, from uh, detainees that have been subject to brutal beatings uh, inside uh, of the police station by policemen who also denied them the right to see an attorney, uh, didn't inform their uh, families, uh, they uh, didn't, uh, people who uh, required medical assistance, they denied them uh, medical assistance, they made them force forced them to sign on uh, long home arrests uh, as as a condition to uh, to have uh, medical attention uh, this ill treatment uh, that we have witnessed inside of uh, the police station uh, was also part of a psychological warfare that we uh, we saw by uh, the israeli police against the palestinian uh, citizens uh, to uh, uh, to spread such a feeling of terror of uh, uh, from the police to uh, uh, make people uh, afraid to protest, but th- of course this didn't succeed. Uh, we are still witnessing the same levels of unity, the same levels of hope that uh, I have mentioned before. Uh, the uh, arrest campaign uh, came to an end uh, a few days ago, ago uh, but uh, still there are more than 600 people still in custody. Uh, we hope that all of them will be released soon. The arrest campaign, like you said, may you know have come to an end and the protests may have sort of subsided um, for now, but something that you did mention earlier in our conversation was that there is this feeling that um, there has been a very um, sort of palpable, concrete change um, in in the way that that Palestinian citizens of Israel and are sort of dealing with their Palestinian identity. And for example, you mentioned the myth of of coexistence and and mixed cities sort of being broken. I want to ask, what is the feeling right now amongst Palestinian communities in in Israel in the aftermath of, you know, of these sudden uprisings and then the the sub uh, the subsequent arrest campaigns, you know, that we've seen over the past month. What are some of those permanent changes that you mentioned, you know, in your opinion, that have uh, that have been made to, to Palestinian life inside Israel and and the identity of Palestinians with Israeli citizenship? Israel have always used the the example of coexistence in mixed cities uh, as uh, uh, as a I would say propaganda tool. Uh, they would just spread uh, all these illusions to uh, the world to uh, to reflect on, yani, to hide part of the story or a huge part of the story. The coexistence in mixed cities, as the uh, Israelis uh, call, is actually uh, haven't have never been there. Yani, uh, when we are talking about Lid uh, Akka Yafa. Uh, Haifa, uh, Ramli, and more. We are talking about Arabs being trapped in ghettos inside of the cities with no rights uh, for housing, no rights for uh, property and land. Uh, their neighborhoods are never developed. They uh, they don't get the municipality uh, uh, services. Uh, so we are talking uh, uh, as a myth of coexistence that uh, have uh, been broken uh, in uh, the recent events. Uh, we we are talking on such a huge uh, level uh, of uh, of of uh, racial difference in uh, 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 between neighborhoods. Uh, uh, inside of uh, of uh, these cities that would tell the whole story of the discrimination uh, in uh, inside uh, Israel. I think this will also reflect on other uh, Palestinians living uh, in their own to- towns and uh, homes, not in the mixed cities, and how they view the Israeli modern life. The, the, uh, the Tel Aviv example, I would say. 
this was a huge example for everyone who thought that Israel is seeking coexistence. That have been proven to be not true. Uh, that the Israeli uh, state have always uh, looked at uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel as enemies and they continue to uh, look, look at them as enemies. Some of the changes I think that that will happen after uh, after these uh, events is the, uh, is restoring the sense of unity. Being part of uh, uh, events that took place in all of historic Palestine would leave uh, uh, its consequences on Palestinians in 48. Uh, these consequences will also take place on the political level. Uh, the uh, demands for political representation as Palestinians, as part of people, should be there. We have witnessed recently that uh, Palestinians in 48 have been sidelined by uh, by the BLO. And I think that this uh, should change after the recent events. You know, we've talked a lot about the hope and and change and all the things that have sort of happened very rapidly over, over the past month. And I want to ask you sort of where do you see things going forward in the new fu- in the near future when it comes to, you know, all the different forms of, of Palestinian resistance to the Israeli occupation, specifically within, um, you know, Palestinian communities inside of Israel. Do you think we're going to see more unity uprisings similar to the ones that we saw last month? Today, uh, the Israeli uh, police decided to cancel the uh, the march of uh, of uh, settlers uh, inside uh, the uh, Jerusalem Old City and uh, to the Ask uh, to the Aqsa Mosque because it, uh, as they described, it may lead to uh, confrontations. This uh, is a huge breakthrough after the recent uh, uprising. Clearly, that uh, what the police means by uh, that it may lead to uh, confrontations is that we should uh, start thinking. A lot more when we uh, want to uh, breach uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, or, for that purpose, uh, any uh, other uh, mosque or city inside uh, in Palestine. Yani this event, this that I mentioned, is, uh, is uh, it testifies by itself on where we, uh, where things are going. I think that the recent uprisings have set uh, a new, uh, uh, a new uh, status quo that uh, Netanyahu government uh, in the recent years have been trying to uh, uh, to break, which is to uh, to break the Palestinian uh, uh, spirit uh, of defending uh, their lands. Uh, their uh, s- uh, sacred uh, places and their lives. Uh, uh, from that going on, I would uh, say that any attack uh, on uh, Al-Aqsa or what we saw in Sheikh Jarrah, uh, uh, any provocations from uh, uh, the Israeli uh, state or by settlers, uh, may of course lead to similar reactions uh, from uh, the Palestinians inside uh, 48. These unity uprisings, uh, they held the name unity for a reason. I think that reason is because they were united with all of Palestine. So uh, the new uh, status quo would say that any event that happened in any place in Palestine will have its echoes uh, in all of Palestine, including 40. Thank you, Wissam Sharaf, for joining us on the Mondawais podcast. And we appreciate you for, for taking the time to, to speak with us and, um, and share your insights on, on all the, the recent events that we've been seeing in Palestine. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening to our show. 
a production of MondoWise.net. The music is from Sound of Picture. Visit our site to sign up for free daily and weekly newsletters on Palestine, Israel, and related U.S. politics. If you're enjoying our podcast, please consider becoming a donor by visiting MondoWise.net slash donate. MondoWise is a nonprofit publication, and every donation of any amount helps sustain our work. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find our show.